Hi everybody, my name is Mark Tennant and it's great to be speaking to you today from the UK. Um, I'm one of the directors of Inspired to Coach. We're a tennis provider and a coach education company in the UK, but we also do quite a lot of stuff around the world. And it's my pleasure to be joining you on the KNL TV Digital Week. I hope you've had a good week. Lots of learning, lots of new content, lots of new things to take away for your, your programs and hopefully some social interaction as well. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about receiving skills and I'm going to share some very, very simple ideas and activities to help young players to read the direction, depth and height of the incoming ball. The videos that I'm going to show you uh, are done on the red court, but without too much modification, you could easily adapt them for the orange court, the green court, or the full-size court as well with the yellow ball, um, and also for adults, because we know that adults also need help with receiving skills. Um, because of time today, I'm just going to show you some very short clips of some of the videos. At the end of this presentation, you'll see a link that I'll share with you how you can access all of the videos and more as well um, in much more um, a, a bigger amount of videos so that you've got a full set of different information that can help you so i'll talk to you about that at the end of this presentation so um, just to begin with let me ask you a question if you and i ever played tennis together and uh, before every shot you were to tell me where you were going to hit the ball uh, would it be a big advantage to me? And if I did the same to you, would it be a huge advantage to you? Of course it would. And so my question really, or my point is that every player can create that same advantage for themselves if they know what to look for. And I think a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is about where players look for information because beginners and, and players who lack experience don't read the signs and don't know what to look for to help them, for example, to know where the ball is going to go. And if we know if the ball is going to come to the backhand or to the forehand, then of course, it's a huge advantage. And so I want to show some very simple strategies that we can use to develop that skill in players of any level, just so they have a feeling of a little bit more time on the court to make the game as easy as possible for them to play. You will know for sure that there are five ball characteristics, the direction, the depth, the height, the speed and spin of the incoming ball. I'm not gonna talk about speed and spin today. I associate that more with slightly more advanced players. Um, the first job I think is for us to learn how to read the direction, depth and the height of the incoming ball in different degrees so that we can at least work on our positioning and be in some shape and form to be able to hit the ball back. When you face the opponent, the incoming direction is the first thing you see. So like this boy here, you're on the baseline, you're looking at the opponent, you're looking at the court in front of you, you see the ball. And the first thing that you see immediately is you start to read the direction of the incoming ball. And that's important to know. OK, you'll pick up the direction of the incoming ball before anything else. And not only that, but the direction is the only thing that doesn't change. The height of the ball is changing all the time. The depth of the ball is changing as it comes towards you. Even the speed and spin are changing as the ball is in flight and, of course, during and after the bounce as well. But unless you've got a very strong wind blowing across the court or unless there's a lot of spin, which you're not going to get at this level, then the direction doesn't change. So if the ball is hit cross court, it stays cross court. If the ball is hit to my backhand, it stays coming to my backhand. And that's really useful information for our beginner players to understand. So into the first video. Um, I'm going to fast forward here to um, a little point at uh, the middle of the video so you can have a look at the, the key bit of information here. I'm going to take you to here and just play the video for a few minutes. So in this drill, you can see the boy here with two cones, happens to be a red and white cone, but of course it can be any color. Um, and the idea is that he's going to call the direction of the incoming ball before the ball crosses this line here. You can see there's a throw down line on the court and this is to simulate the net. That's really important in all of this. So here's the baseline. 
here's the net for this activity. And as I've just said, we want to make it very obvious through the gestures where the ball is going. Why? Because it then teaches this player here to look at the opponent to start to read for clues and signs of what's going to happen. I'll just run it for a few more minutes. Okay, so it's very simple. As I said, you can watch the whole video uh, afterwards if you, if you want. I'll show you all the details. I'm just going to fast forward on a little bit more to here, just so you can pick up a little bit more information from this drill. Important to say here that uh, receiving skills is not just about seeing the ball and knowing where the ball is going to go. It's also about making sure we're in an optimal position so that we then have tactical choices and we can be technically efficient with our play, even at beginner level, to help us to be able to direct the ball around the court. So I was making the point there that already we can start to focus on the positioning and the setup. If you want to start to talk about a semi-open stance that we can we can talk about that. I wouldn't suggest we use that terminology with our players yet, but that's essentially what we're starting to do already in a simple activity. So that was the first activity. Very, very simple. Um, the point I made here is really important about the T in SMART. So specific, measurable, agreed, realistic and timed goals. So by putting a line here, we start to add a time frame to this drill. And the time goal is that you must call the direction of the incoming ball before the ball is crossing the net. And that's a really good attitude to develop in our young players or our beginners right from the beginning. The next point is that we've got to telegraph the feed. I made that point in the video so we can see the boy here is looking at my hand. And that's a really good message when I go to the other end of the court that the boy is going to start looking at his opponent for all the information that he needs to read the incoming ball. So even where it very, with very simple drills like this, there's, there's detail that we can put in to a simple drill like this. So as I mentioned, look for the position of the outside foot and you can start to talk about loading in a very simple way, even at this level. You can start to talk about balance by making sure that the players receive the ball with a wide base so that they can manage their dynamic balance. And in a little while, I'll talk about a, a big principle that I have, a very simple idea that we need to look for a triangle shape in our setup. So that's simply about having the head above the base. And you can see that um, in these videos with these kids here. So moving on to the next video, um, I'm going to move on here to about, let's see, to about here. And it's pretty much the same drill, but we're using a bigger ball here. So that's the time frame on the receiving skill. I also made the point about how well he's recovering or how quickly he's recovering. If you wanted to add an extra dimension, you could get the boy to recover back to the middle of the court before his ball is crossing the net on its way back to me. So you can add a double time frame goal into this as well. I'm going to fast forward the video. Again, it's very simple stuff, but there's a lot of detail that you can put in even into very simple activities like this. And I think sometimes we miss the opportunity for some of the detail and we look for more complex drill. Maybe sometimes we need to think about a simple dr drill done well. Okay, so just fast forwarded this so you can see the two boys together.
So this is a direction drill. So I've made the point about trying to keep every ball, incoming ball at this stage to a reasonably similar length so that he doesn't have the additional challenge of moving backwards to a deeper ball or short um, forwards to a shorter ball. Of course, that's important, but we sometimes have to go in layers with these drills. So exactly the same principles as the, with the rolling ball. Um, We've got the T and smart using the line on the, um, on the, for the net uh, as we did before. And as I've already made the point, we could use the line on the way back as well to add a, a time frame goal for the recovery if you wanted to add an extra dimension. Again, telegraphing the feed, encouraging the players to look at the opponent, really, really important in all of these drills, I believe. And again, we've got the same points here about the positioning, the loading, the balance, and the head above the base, the triangle. So same things, but a different dimension, because of course here we've got two flight paths. You've got the flight path before the bounce, and then you've got the second flight path after the bounce. And what happens with a lot of beginners is that they see the ball and they start to move towards the ball, and then they end up too close to the bounce of the ball. They panic a little bit. And we'll address that later on when we look at um, a drill with a falling ball. Okay, the other thing is, of course, that by using a bigger ball, we're engaging the upper body because we're using two hands. So that starts to simulate more tennis related action. So there's a lot of value in that. Moving on to the next drill, um, I'm going to fast forward on to about here. This one is called alleys. It's very simple. You can see I've marked almost like a, a tram line almost down the middle of the court here. And I'm going to start by basket feeding, but of course this can be done in a rally, as you'll see in a minute as well. Also important to make the point that when the player is returning the ball, the rules of the game say the ball needs to stay in the court. Right. So I know it's very obvious, but these are the little things that can add a bit of quality. So make sure your player, when they're returning the ball, of course, is working on the receiving skill down here. But you have to challenge them as well to get the ball back into play. OK, so you notice that I'm slightly inside the court here, but one or two of the balls I'm catching on the volley at waist height, they're probably going out. And I think that's something else to challenge your player with. Just going to fast forward it so we can see the two boys together in a moment. Um, here it is from behind. Okay, and then if I fast forward until we get the two boys in the court together. Uh, and the important thing here is that this is done in a cooperative way. We need to give the receiver the time in a cooperative manner first to get used to this drill. So let's see it happening here. I think there's an additional thing here as well, which is that uh, when we're working with groups of players, it's really important to educate those kids um, to become feeders at times. They can't always be the center of attention and always working on something themselves. So down here, we have the receiver working on his thing. But down here as well, this boy is working on some very simple, you might almost call them coaching skills. He's having to become a cooperative feeder. So let these activities run in an independent way. You don't always have to be doing all of the feeding yourself. And I think that's a, that's a good additional message. So again, a very simple drill here, um, working on the same things, calling the direction of the incoming ball very quickly and moving to make sure that we're in the best possible position to respond. So 
just the key points on alleys. Again, we have the T in smart. Now the T in smart here is around the real net because the feeding is now done from the opposite baseline instead of being done in here. So you can adjust your time frame goals as much as you want. I could actually put a line down here on my side of the net if I wanted to make the time really limited and really challenging for him. If he found it quite tough, still we could put the line on this side, on his side of the net, and that just gives him a little bit more time to pull the direction of the incoming ball. Quick reading, beating the bounce with the setup as well. So you can see here that he's well set up. Um, if we were to take it back just a, uh, a second, then you may see how he is in position as the ball is bouncing. But I'm pretty confident that he's beating the bounce quite well with the setup. And you can also see um, how he's well balanced there to play his forehand. OK, so with the positioning on the outside foot, you can see and the triangle that I was talking about a moment ago. I like that picture, not just for coaches, but also for players to start to feel their balance by thinking about the head and also the belly button. OK, you might think that the belly button is there for some other reason. OK, but actually the belly button is there for tennis and tennis only. It's to know that you have balance because you want to make sure that you have your belly button above your base. OK, so that triangle is an important position for your players to understand. OK, um, of course, I could put some lines on my side of the net as well, and then we could make it into uh, more of a tactical game. So, for example, when Lewis here is playing from the outside, the task is that he has to respond to the inside. Or if I hit down the middle to him, then he has to go to the outside. And that changes the purpose of the drill a little bit, makes it more of a tactical drill. Still has a receiving skill element to it, but it brings in more decision making and a tactical element to the drill. OK. And then, uh, of course, you can modify the drill by making it as a basket feed. You could also make it closer and have it as a throw and catch. But I like this one as a cooperative rally exercise. And of course, you could think about how to make it a competitive rally exercise if you wanted as a further progression. OK, on to the next one. This is about throwing and calling. And this is about the height of contact. So we're now moving not just to think about the direction, but also the height and depth, which very often those things will come together. So we're now looking at the height of the contact. And I'm going to fast forward again this drill just so you can see the key highlights of the drill. You can see that I have three cones there, OK? Um, we could make that an orange one for the Dutch, of course, and have uh, uh, an orange one with a white one and a blue one. But uh, we've gone red, white, and blue for the UK here. So I'm going to just uh, fast forward to here, OK? So the purpose here is to call where he thinks the ball is going to bounce. Let me move it on to here. Let's see. Let me also just make a point about this guy here. I love not just his ready position, but more importantly, his ready condition. Look how mentally he's totally zoned into this practice, and that's essential for receiving skills. Quite often, players aren't reading the ball because they're not really awake to what's going on on the tennis court. So look at how attentive and focused he is here. So look for ready position and look for ready condition, a physical and a mental state. If we think about the different heights of contact, of course, we can have a ball that's rising off the bounce. You can have a ball that's at the top of the bounce or you can have a falling ball. And of course, for a beginner or a lower level player, even for adults, a falling ball is much easier to deal with because anything where we have to work at our extremities as a tennis player is much more of a challenge. The disadvantage sometimes about the falling ball is that we have to move backwards, which is a problem for some players. And of course, there are times when the ball is a little bit shorter. We don't want the ball to be falling because that gives time back to the opponent. But for this drill, the task is that they are catching the ball as it's falling.
Okay, so very simple activity here again. Lots to focus on because we've got direction as well as height and depth to think about here. And again, I want to make sure that I telegraph the feed a little bit to give them a little bit more time, but also to teach them that they have to start to look at the opponent for the clues on the ball. So let's uh, get the two boys to do it together here, I think. Here we go. So again, we have the time frame here, and this is tough because these two lines are pretty close together. You may actually want to move this line a little bit this way to give the receiver a little bit more time here. Again, let's make the point that it's important that these boys work together. So we have feeding as an additional skill for this guy. I can then monitor and supervise, and of course, in a group lesson, we may have other kids on the other court, so I'm walking around, or maybe I've got an assistant as well. So let the kids be independent with these drills. Okay, so very clear, I think, I hope. So this was about the height of contact. So again, telegraph the feed, encourage the players to look at the opponent to read the signs. Make sure that they are reading the ball quickly because a lot of players actually have a little bit more time when the ball is coming high and deep, but they don't realize it and they don't move back. So we have to still beat the bounce. And of course we have to look to beat the bounce in a different way on a shorter ball because we want to take time away from the opponent. Catching a falling ball, important. Of course, as the players develop, we don't want them only catching a falling ball, but we have to work on these things in stages and look at what's best for our beginner players. Okay, on to the next one now. Um, so this one is with a different piece of equipment, very similar exercise, but with a cone. And the reason here that we're using a cone in the hand is to emphasize the importance of catching the falling ball. Again, very simple, okay? And you can see it demonstrated here. And you can see again my position here. We're not forgetting about looking at balance being turned on, uh, turned towards the court in our semi-open position. Okay, and of course looking at the point of contact in front as well. So all of those things are still important ingredients in this drill. Let's move it on and let's see the boys doing this together. Here we go. So did you see there how his instinct was to run towards the ball and then he had to move back a little bit? A lot of beginners do that. So um, it's really important that we practice reading the depth of the incoming ball and understanding whether our reaction needs to take us forwards a few steps because we are taking a short ball or whether we're actually going forwards a little bit in order to push back and then go behind the baseline very quickly. Okay, let's move it on again. Just to make a few more here. Of course, working with children and animals, you never quite know what's going to happen. It's the real world. So I'm using the point there about the, the triangle to give the players the chance to self-analyze. I think that's really important. And with a simple drill like this, because they're not hitting the ball, they can just freeze for a moment on contact and they can see whether the contact is falling, whether it's close, too far, whether they have the triangle, are they semi-open, are they balanced, all of those things are really good learning opportunities for the players. So challenge the players to self-analyze. And it's not just about you teaching, it's about you creating a learning environment. So it's not just about you giving feedback to the kids all the time, get the kids the feedback to you. I think that's very important. Okay, moving on again. Um, so key points, again, telegraphing the feed, okay, so that the players know if the ball is going to be coming a little bit deeper or a little bit shorter, okay? Beating the bounce one more time, and again, looking for the triangle, but this time it's more vertical, and by that I mean that I'm moving forwards, 
as opposed to it being more lateral. So you could have a lateral triangle moving out to the direction of the incoming ball, or you could have vertical triangle and vertical balance by moving forwards inside the baseline or backwards behind the baseline. Catching a falling ball, as I've already mentioned several times. And then onto the next drill, where we're looking here at the height and the depth, but we're doing it in a rally. Okay, that's the next stage. So we still have the cones down the side of the court, as you can see, but in a different position. And the goal is pretty similar, but it's done in a rally. So here I'm doing it as a cooperative rally feed. Of course, you can do it as a basket feed. Of course, you could simplify it even more by doing it uh, as a throw activity. But I quite like the fact that we have to speed up to real time because that's what the kids are going to get when they play together. So at some point, we have to accelerate all of this and we have to work on it in real time. And we have to keep challenging about their ability to read the incoming direction or in this case the height and the depth of the ball so let me just move it on a little bit more so you can see the two boys doing it together let's move to here and see what I'm not sure if you can hear, but he's calling short, medium or deep. Of course, it could be red, white or blue. And of course, ultimately, you don't want them calling anything at all. It's going to drive you crazy if you're having a, to commentate as you're playing. So this is only for the training exercise. I don't intend for the players to always be calling out all the time. I think it's more important that they actually focus on the moving and the hitting rather than um, telling me where they think the ball is going to bounce. So these are just training exercises. But you get the idea. And um, again, some really valuable learning here, I think, for the young players. Okay, so this one was about direction, height, and depth in a rally. Okay, and again, we're beating the bounce and keep challenging your players about that. It's not always that easy to do, but if we create that goal and that mentality, even if they are slightly late and they're not quite beating the bounce, they were certainly trying. And trying to beat the bounce is better than not trying to beat the bounce. Okay. So look for lateral balance when they're moving out left and right and look for a lateral triangle and look for vertical balance when they're moving forwards and also especially backwards where the head tends to fall back a little bit, the front foot comes up and then they lose balance and control. So challenge them to move early so that they can find balance on strike. I think that's a really important challenge for them and that's a really good indicator of receiving skills. If you can play your shots with two feet on the court, that says you have pretty good receiving skills, I think. We're looking still to hit a falling ball, although, of course, tactically, we know this is flawed. There are going to be some shorter balls here where the players will want to take the time away. But for the purpose of this exercise, the teaching point was a falling ball. So I've shown you a few little videos there. And as I said, it was very quick, but uh, you can have a look. Uh, I'll show you the link in a moment where you can see the videos in full. So let's think about a little action plan by taking away some key points that hopefully you can put into your coaching and into your program and some things you can reflect on. So the first thing is a simple question. How much time do you give for receiving skill practice compared to sending skill practice? My experience around the world is that traditional tennis coaching focuses very much more on sending than it does on receiving skills. I think we have to redress that balance. And the reason for that is when you watch our players 
Actually, most of the mistakes come from the receiving part of the game. The mistakes don't come from how they are hitting the ball. The mistakes are coming from how they are receiving the ball. So we have to make sure that we focus on where the mistakes originate from. Secondly, can you find ways to help your players to improve uh, their ability to read the incoming ball and how quickly they can do it? We saw some exercises there that perhaps can help you to do that. What details do you need to focus on? This isn't just about knowing where the ball's going to bounce, but we could see, for example, we were working on the setup, we were working on the position of the outside foot, we were talking about the width of the base and the lateral or the vertical triangle, we were talking about a falling ball, we were talking about the point of contact, we were talking about beating the bounce, we were talking about a time frame goal when the ball is coming in, and also perhaps even a time frame goal on a recovery. So there are a lot of different areas that you can work on. And I also mentioned about the ready position and ready condition. So there are probably eight or nine different things there you can put into a really simple drill, but which will take your coaching and your drills to the next stage, to the next level. Can you find ways not just to work on the receiving skill, but also positioning? So that's the point I've just made. Look at how the players are set up and whether a semi-open stance is going to help them to then be able to decide if they want to go down the line with the forehand or the backhand, or to go cross-court deep or cross-court short. When the, the front leg starts to cross over and the hips block off, then that really limits your tactical options. And of course, it also makes you less efficient in terms of your setup from a physical point of view when you're playing the stroke. So look at the, the positioning and not just the ability to receive the ball. And can you take some of the principles from this presentation and maybe apply them in your own drills that you might have, which I didn't show you today. I'm sure you've got some of your own drills as well. So take some of the principles I've just listed and maybe implement them into your own drills. So finally, let me just invite you to join our website at tennis247.co.uk. You'll see the link here. Okay, and it's completely free to join. There is no money to pay. Okay, we don't want your money. Well, we would, but we're not going to take it. Um, and if you go, once you're a member, once you've joined, if you go to the Coach Academy section in the tips and technical fixes, you will find a whole set of different videos there on receiving skills. And the ones that I've shown you today are part of those, but there are others as well. And there are other different resources in there on receiving skills. So uh, be my guest, please, to join as a member of Tennis 24-7 and to sign up in the Coach Academy. There is more than just the receiving skills. You'll see a lot of other things in there as well. There's some great interviews and resources. So uh, be my guest to join there. And of course, you can follow us uh, on Facebook or on Instagram as well. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope it's been useful. I hope it's been uh, interesting. Maybe it's just confirmed things that you already do. Maybe it's given you an extra layer of detail to what you are doing. Or maybe it's given you some new thoughts. I don't know. But uh, whichever it is, thank you for listening. Enjoy your coaching and good luck with your receiving skills.